Welcome ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about the SD KFZ 181, also known as the Tiger 1. This is one of the most feared tanks ever created and also one of the most well known tanks together with the American M4 Sherman. If you were to approach a random stranger on the street and were to ask them if they could name any tank, the tank they most likely would name is the Tiger 1. Today we're going to see how good the Tiger 1 really was and at the end of the video I will share my opinion on the tank. I expect this video to become a bit longer than I normally do, so strap in and enjoy the ride. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like as I'm aiming for the 150 likes on this video. Now let's get right into the video. One of the most notable things when you look at the Tiger is that it seems very dangerous, especially with its big main armament. It was named the 88mm KWK 36 L56. The 88mm stands for the diameter of the round. The KWK means Kampfwagen Kanonne, which translates to chariot gun, and the L slash means that the 88mm fits 56 times in the main armament, so this would mean that it's 4.9 meters long. It fired the Panzer Granate 39 and the Panzer Granate 40. When you compare these two rounds, you notice that the 40 variant has a considerable higher amount of penetration force than the 39 variant. It is also lighter and has a higher muzzle velocity. It also had the SBRGR, which is the name for the high explosive, which is mainly for anti-personnel meanings and light armored vehicles. And it could also fire a heat round. This graph shows you how good the penetration levels of the Tiger's main armament really was when you compare it to its opponents. So for the Soviet Union, it was the 76.2mm F-34 used for the T-34 and the KV-1. And for the US, it was the 75mm L-40. The Tiger had two secondary armaments and these were the MG-34 and these had 4500 rounds on board and 4800 for the Tiger 1E version. The Tiger would be nothing without its armor. The Tiger was the heaviest armored tank ever used on the battlefield when it entered service tied with the Churchill. The Tiger 1 at its thickest point had about 102mm of armor. The 102mm of armor was also angled at 81 degrees but it doesn't really improve the effectivity of the armor. The thinnest point was the roof, the floor and the engine cover. These were all 26mm thick. However, the roof was later upgraded to 14mm because it was insufficient to protect the crew from artillery fire and from aircraft. To give you guys a proper example of how important it is, in 1943 there was a battle near the village of Samarnikovo, where Lieutenant Sebel recalls how it is to fight in one of these vehicles. To quickly summarize the experience, after the battle they counted 227 anti-tank bullets on their tank. 14 57 mm dents and 11 76.2 mm dents. Even though receiving damage notably to its tracks on other parts, it still kept going. So, in his own words, and I quote, subsequently, it can be said that the armor of the Tiger had come up to our expectations. The Tiger 1 had a Maybach HL 230 engine, which has 690 horsepower, and this allowed the 57 ton tank to reach a top speed of 45 km an hour and off-road this was reduced to 20 km an hour. However, according to the book written by Otto Karius, in consideration of the equipment they never drove faster than 25 km an hour. And of course this is also the same of when they were driving off-road. If all the components worked the way it was intended, it had an operational range of 195 km. On the road and off-road this would be reduced to 110 km. Autocarius also states, it really drove like a car. With two fingers we could easily shift 700 horsepower, steer 60 tons and drive 45 km an hour. He went on by saying that the maintenance of the batteries were very important. They had to be constantly charged up by letting the engine run whenever they didn't drive a lot. Otherwise the starter wouldn't turn on the engines anymore and the two crew members had to start the engine from the back. As you can imagine, it's not a great thrill to do this in the middle of a battle. However, they found a quicker way to do this. A neighbor tank was called over, turned the turret and pushed the stranded tank and the engine reported normally after the first few meters. Now you may ask yourself, what was so important about those batteries? Well, a lot depended on the batteries, like the inner and outer lights, the radio equipment, the ventilators and the electro-ignition for the canner also depended on it. The Tiger was a huge vehicle, it was 8.5 meters long, 3.6 meters wide and exactly 3 meters high. This allowed there to be 5 crew members in the tank. These consisted of a commander, a gunner, a loader, a driver and a radio operator. 
These crewmen needed to read the manual very carefully because it was a very strong and expensive weapon. However, experience showed that young tankers had little interest in reading over these boring pages of the manuals. So a man by the name of Heinz Guderian allowed the engineers to fill the official Tiger handbook to be filled with jokes and pictures of women to keep the reader interested, and that certainly worked to some degree. The reason why I said this worked is because future manuals did the same. The Tiger Fiber became known as a war souvenir so a lot of these did do survive the war. The Tiger was only built with combat performance in mind, the rest was all secondary, like for example reliability and handling. But it could have been worse. Of course we know the Tiger as we know it and love it today, but there were two manufacturers making prototypes for the Tiger. Of course one being Henschel, but the other one was Porsche. They proposed the VK4501P, where they made 100 hulls for. They used two V10 engines instead of one V12, and these two sat side by side to each other in a cramped space with poor ventilation. So as you can imagine, overheating was a constant issue for this design, it broke down frequently and sometimes went up in flames. These hulls were eventually reused for another project called the Ferdinand, also known as the Elephant. But even though the Tiger One was less prone to suddenly catch fire, it was still very unreliable. It was also plagued by track failures and gearbox failures, another issue was that it could easily get immobilized by mud, snow or something of that sort. And especially on the eastern front, mud and snow were very common. The Tiger also consumed a very high amount of fuel, which made supplying it with enough fuel difficult. For transport the Tiger had narrower tracks fitted, so it was easier to transport. Once it arrived at the destination, the narrow tracks were replaced with wider ones. Everyone has heard stories about something which is called Tigerphobia, and even though it was real, it wasn't as much as people are often led to believe. The stories of Shermans refusing to engage Tiger tanks is more often down to tactics. Because according to the Allies, engaging tanks was an artillery job. If a Sherman tanker spotted a Tiger, they radioed the position to the artillery and then they fired in that area. Like I stated before, the Tiger one was very expensive to make, both in materials and money. If you account for inflation, making one Tiger is about one third of making an M1 Abrams. It was so expensive that you could build 21 105mm howitzers for one Tiger one tank. It took 300,000 man hours to build one Tiger one tank, that is double that of the Panther. The Tiger was also used as a base for different armored fighting vehicles or tanks. So for example the Sturm Tiger, the Meme AFV with the 380mm main armament was actually built on the Tiger 1 chassis. And the famous Tiger 131 was the Tiger 1H version and you also have a Tiger E version. Now we come to everyone's favorite part, service history. I will talk about the most interesting and best and worst feats of the Tiger 1. First usage. The first unit to receive the Tiger 1 was the Swearer Panzer up to Lung 502 which received 4 of them. These four were deployed near Leningrad, but like I explained before, the Tiger One wasn't good in soft swampy terrain, so they sank a bit in the ground immobilizing them. So they became easy targets for Soviet anti-tank guns. They were repeatedly hit, but none did penetrate the tank itself. However, their weakness to poor terrain was immediately exposed. Three of the four of them became disabled either through mechanical failures, enemy fire breaking their tracks, or due to the terrain. These tanks had to be recovered, however one of them was basically impossible to recover. So they decided it was better to just blow it up instead. This was a big lesson to be learned from Germany right from the get go. As a result of the British successes at El Alamein in North Africa in November 1942, Tiger tanks were sent to Tunisia to bolster the strength of the German and Italian forces. The first three vehicles arrived at Port Bizerte on the 23rd of November with a total of 20 being sent. Their combat debut in North Africa came when engaging M3 lead tanks near the town of Deerdada on the 1st of December 1942. The dense olive groves meant that the combat range became very short, often under 100 meters, where the Tiger received many hits on the weaker side of their armor. However, the Tiger was victorious and counted two M3 leads destroyed as their first success. This action was followed up with attacks on American forces between Deerdada and Terburba, destroying a total of 4 anti-tank guns, 6 Stuart light tanks, 2 half-tracks, a various soft-skinned vehicles and an unknown number of men, for the loss of 3 Panzer III's and no Tigers. On the 10th of December, 5 Tigers encountered 20-25 M3 and M5 tanks who were harassing German artillery. 
the Tigers managed to knock out 12 of them for no losses. The 37mm on the M3 and M5 light tanks proved to be useless against the Tiger. And of course the most popular Tiger tank, the Tiger 131, was also knocked out and captured here. There are several theories about this, but the most accepted theory is, is that it was knocked out by Churchill Cell, breaking the third ring, and the Tiger was ended up abandoned by its crew. It was during the Soviet 1943 offense that the impact of the Tiger was truly felt when despite operating not more than 7 Tigers in the field at the time, they were credited with nearly a quarter of all Soviet tank losses. The first large scale combat action for the Tiger 1 took place in July 1943, during Operation Citadel at Kursk, where 146 Tigers were used, but eventually they lost this offense. The Tiger was also deployed to try to stop the invasion of Anzio. Here we'll see why the Tiger was seen as unreliable, because 60% of the Tiger 1 tanks suffered from mechanical issues on the way to the front lines. This was over the course of 200 kilometers, because they could not be transported further due to enemy air superiority. Ultimately, Allies managed to break out and liberate Italy. Of course when we talk about this we also need to mention some of the highest decorated aces who fought in a Tiger 1 tank. Names like Michael Whitman, Kurt Knispel and Otto Karius come to mind. Now first before finishing the script I decided to see what you guys thought of this tank. So I did a poll and asked you guys and the reactions were mixed. Some argued for it to have been one of the best tanks of the Second World War, and others said that the reliability issues were so much of a hindrance that it could not be classified better than mediocre. And others have pointed out that I forgot to add an option, it was a good tank, just not the best of Germany of World War II. In a time where innovation went so incredibly quick, I'd say yeah, the Tiger I was probably one of the best and strongest vehicles for two years, and it's incredibly impressive that it could basically dominate the battlefield for two years. But then again, it was very unreliable, so I'd say, in terms of performance, yeah, I'd say it's the best tank Germany has had in World War II. But just the entire package, its weight, its fuel consumption, stuff like that, I'm not gonna give it that crown. Anyway, that was it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like, and I'll see you guys in the next video.